Thank you. Thank you, Dean Olean. It is an honor to be here with Anderson's distinguished faculty and board, proud parents, patient friends, and most importantly, the graduates of 2011. Congratulations to all of you guys. I want to thank Andy Katzman for being here with me today. Andy is a 2005 graduate of the Anderson School who now works at Facebook, running our platform partnerships. And I also want to say just a special congratulations to the members of this class who used to work on my team at Google. Tyler Peterson, Stephanie Wong, Terry Hurlbut, Alex Rosen, Joseph Wong, Calvin Chen, and Stephanie Kong. Just a special congratulations from me to you. I'm proud of you guys. So when most of you began your studies here, the economy was in a free fall. So I should start by commending the full-time students for picking exactly the right two years not to be in the workforce. Nice, nicely done. For all of you, I wish that you are entering a growing economy which will provide plenty of opportunities for anything you want to pursue. Each generation believes that the world is more complicated than the world was the generation before. And I think that's not just ego, I think it's true. When I think about the world when I graduated from business school 16 years ago, it was slower and much less connected. My business school section tried to have a class online and we used the tools we had, our dial-up service and an AOL chat room. Yes, I am that old. And it didn't work. It didn't work because we all kept getting kicked off because the technology couldn't actually handle 90 people trying to communicate simultaneously, something that sounds funny today. But for one moment, we glanced the future, a future where you could connect with anyone in the world as an individual from your dorm room in your pajamas. Now, the pajama thing never really worked out for me, but it won't surprise you to know that I think the information technology revolution has changed the world. Information that was once only available in libraries and on microfiche, parents, explain later what microfiche is, please, to this class, is available to everyone at our fingertips. And not only are we connected to information, but because of social network networking, we're connected to each other as individuals. Individuals have never been this empowered. In past generations, what we have was only power possible for the rich and powerful. Today, all of us are not just receivers, but we are broadcasters of information. We have an unprecedented ability to take our individual voice and amplify it. Over the past 10 years, as we've learned to use these tools, our individual voices are growing louder and stronger. Sometimes they take the form of a YouTube video telling us to leave Britney Spears alone. But sometimes they're far more profound, and they're the voices of the people of Tunisia and Egypt rising up to reclaim their country. So the question I have for you today is what will you do with your unique, your loud, and your very powerful voice? What will you do with the skills you've worked so hard to learn here? You've studied the history of industries, management practices, competitive, competitive strategy. You're ready to make your mark, not just to rejoin the workforce or stay in the workforce, but not have all that extra work with you, but to start writing the history that the next generation of students will read. You're ready not just to contribute, but to lead. Leadership belongs to those who grab it. It's not handed out at the end of a party like a party favor. Leadership starts with you. And the best advice I can give you is that the best kind of leadership starts by finding something you really believe in. Facebook exists because Mark Zuckerberg believed that the world would be a better place if we all use technology to share and connect. He believed in that enough to drop out of school at 19, and he believed in it enough to hang on to that vision and hold on to it, even when people tried to take it away from him over the years. I joined Facebook, along with so many others, because I too believe in that vision. And now it's the most important part of my job to keep myself and everyone else at Facebook maniacally focused on what we are trying to do day in and day out. 
So start. Start by finding a company you believe in, a product you love, something, a cause you really, really care about. Because not, not only will you inspire yourself, will you be inspired, but you in turn will inspire others. And that's the most critical part of great leadership. All organizations have some form of hierarchy. People in organizations, if you're their manager, will do what you tell them to do, even at Facebook, at least some of the time. But great leaders don't want compliance. They don't want people to follow orders. Great leaders want real excitement, genuine enthusiasm, real commitment. Great leaders don't just win the minds of their team, they win their hearts. Great leaders don't just issue commands, they heed the voices of those around them. Soon after I joined Facebook in 2008, the Summer Olympics happened in Beijing. And Michael Phelps went on there to win that world-famous, record-breaking eighth gold medal. Michael Phelps was an early Facebook adopter, the second person to ever have a million fans or followers on Facebook. And he kept getting interviewed after he won that gold medal, and he kept thanking us. You know, follow me on Facebook, friend me on Facebook, keep in touch with me on Facebook. Facebook had long had a very strict policy of no editorial voice. And by that, we meant that the page is yours, and we shouldn't put anything from us on that page. It was an infringement in your, in your space. But I thought it was pretty cool that Michael Phelps kept thanking us. And so over a weekend, Mark and I decided that we would put a little sign on the top of the US facing pages to US users, which said, Facebook congratulates Michael Phelps and the US Olympic team. Pretty uncontroversial stuff. Company went crazy. Absolutely crazy. Not just because we had used editorial voice, even though they didn't like that much. They went crazy because Mark and I made the decision over a weekend without talking to the teams that worked on the homepage. So what did we do? We could have marched around the halls and explained to everyone that, hey, you work for us. We made a decision. We're allowed to do that. You're supposed to listen. But that's not what we did at all. <laughs> Welcome. A future business school graduate, no doubt. But we didn't do that at all. Instead, what we did is look at the company and say, we're sorry. We'll figure out together if we're using editorial voice again. We haven't done it. But most importantly, we're not going to make decisions again without the teams who work on those products. As a leader, how are you going to inspire your teams? Are you going to think that the best ideas are always yours? Are you going to think that the, what you have to do is come up with ideas or believe they're yours for the teams to follow it? And when you have an idea you really believe in, believe in are you going to be able to convince people not just to do it, but to follow you with real enthusiasm. I do my best to get ideas from the teams I work with. Even though they work for me, they're closer to it than I am. They know more and I can always learn from them. And then when I have something I really believe in, I do my best to convince people to be excited about it. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes I have to look at a group of people in my conference room and say, I hear you, I've heard all your objections, but we've talked about this enough Here's what we're gonna do, let's get started. Those moments for me are failures. I really believe we lead best when we walk side by side with our colleagues. And to achieve this, you're gonna to have to do the opposite of what I'm doing right now. You're gonna to have to not just talk, but really listen. And you have to go one step further, which is not just listen, but find a way to get people to actually tell you the truth. If you watch young children, you'll be surprised at how unbelievably honest they are, which makes us actually realize how unbelievably not honest we are as adults most of the time. My friend Betsy had a five-year-old son, Sam, when she got pregnant with her second child. And her son was trying to figure out where the baby was in her body, and he would say, Mommy, where's the baby? And she said, well, the baby's in my tummy. Well, Mommy, are the baby's hands in your hands? No whole baby's in my tummy. Mommy, are the baby's legs in your legs? No, Sam, whole baby's in my tummy. And he said, Mommy, what's growing in your butt? <laughs> As
as adults, we're never this honest, and that's not always bad. I've borne two children. The last thing I needed was honesty about my changing physique. But it's not always good either, because all of us, especially when you're in a leadership role, really need to hear the truth. The culture of Facebook reflects this commitment. We have no offices, no cubes, no partitions. Mark and I, along with all our leaders, sit out in open space along with everyone else. We have a company-wide Q&A every single Friday that we attend. We'll listen to anything or answer any question. And we encourage people not just to disagree with us, but to disagree with us openly on Facebook and in person. Setting yourself up to hear the truth is a real challenge because no matter how many times you tell people who work for you and work with you, I really want you to tell me the truth. Tell me if I mess something up. It's really hard to get them to believe that that's what you want to hear. One trick I've figured out over the years is I try to speak really openly about my weaknesses or my flaws. That gives people permission to agree with me, which is a lot easier than pointing it out in the first place. In meetings, I sometimes speak too much. Probably, I often speak too much. And I talk about it really openly, because then my teams can give me that look or let me know when it's happening. But if I never said anything, how many people who work at Facebook would walk up to me today, today and say, hey, Cheryl, you talk too much in that meeting? Probably absolutely no one. Remember that to get to the truth, honesty must actually be rewarded. Last summer, we had a bunch of interns at a barbecue at Mark's house. And one of them, in front of 70 other people, looked at Mark and said, you know, you really should be a better public speaker. That would be better for the company. The next day, Mark and I tracked down that intern to make sure we hired him, because that's exactly the kind of person we want in our company. We like people who challenge us. We want different ways of thinking, unique perspectives. The key to success for any leader is not just to develop people like you. That's easy. You'll naturally gravitate towards them. But to go the extra mile and find people who are different, those are the people you're going to learn from. And then once you've found these unique individuals, don't bring them into your company or organization and then make them all fit some outdated corporate mold. Because then, why bother finding unique individuals in the first place? Instead, encourage everyone to be authentic at work. I talk a lot about bringing your whole self to work, something I really believe in deeply. Motivation comes from working on things we care about, missions, passions, causes. But motivation also comes from working with people we care about. And the only way to really care about someone is to understand them. You have to know what they love and hate. You have to know not just what they think, but what they feel. I don't believe we have some professional self on Mondays through Fridays, and then we can put that self away and be some different self the rest of the week. That's probably never worked, but in today's era of social networking, Facebook, individual voice, it probably makes even less sense. I've cried at work. I've said publicly I've cried at work, which got reported as Sheryl Sandberg cried on Mark Zuckerberg's shoulder, which is not exactly how it happened. I speak about being a woman. I give public talks about the differences between men and women, something people are continually shocked at because the traditional way to be a woman, someone who's a little different in the workforce, is to never talk about it. I don't think that works. I talk about my hopes and fears. I admit if I'm having a good day or a bad day. I ask people about their hopes and fears and ask them if they're having a good or a bad day. I try to be myself with all of my honest strengths and my honest weaknesses, and I encourage others to do the same. It's all professional and it's all personal because each of us are exactly one human being, all wrapped up together, just like we are on Facebook. Today is a day of celebration, a day to celebrate all the hard work that got you to this place where you could sit at this beautiful school with these beautiful people and friends and family in that gown. Today is a day of thanks, a day to thank the people who nurtured you, who taught you, who held your hand, who dried your tears. Today is a day of reflection, a day to think about what kind of person you want to be and what kind of leader you want to be. 
As you and your classmates walk across the stage and spread out across the globe, I wish for you four things. One, keep in touch via Facebook. Facebook usage is absolutely critical to your future success. The more you do it, the more successful you're going to be. It's very clear. Two, make the effort to speak as well as seek the real truth. Three, remain true to and open about your authentic self. And four, find work that stirs your passion, a mission that matters to you and matters to others. It's the ultimate luxury to combine passion and contribution. It's also the only real path to happiness I've ever seen work. I join everyone here in offering my very heartfelt congratulations to this class. And if your authentic self wants to cheer for yourselves, do it. Congratulations.